I, 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 if, I, if I just speak for 10 minutes maybe about uh, Snowden and uh, the story and, and what's happened to the story and what I think it means, then probably the most interesting thing is, is to see what, what you find interesting and, and we can have a conversation about it. Um, it, it the, the origins of the story for me uh, go back to our decision to hire Glenn Greenwald uh, because that was something the New York Times would never have done uh, and it, it was a decision that came out of the thinking that we have had when Anton talks about our strategy one of the, one of the forks in the road we felt media were coming to was, was whether you were going to be open or closed and, and in shorthand terms, we thought uh, the only path for the Guardian really was to be, was to be open. That, that, that meant to embrace this world in which uh, a host of new voices was going to be able to publish themselves, uh, and that if you could be open to that uh, and harness the best of it, you would have something that was better than you could do. And, uh, in, in the sort of 19th century journalistic model where, where newspapers had to, professional newspaper people had to do everything themselves and so hiring someone like Glenn who was not a conventional journalist who lived uh, on the edge of a rainforest in Brazil uh, who was to some people's mind an, an activist not a journalist who had a huge following of his own, about a community of probably about a million people uh, with whom he interacted in a very contemporary way. That was, the story wouldn't have happened without taking that decision. And in my conversations later with the New York Times, um, they, didn't, they, they, they simply didn't know how to handle someone like Glenn. They, they, they just found that such a confusing phenomenon. Uh, and, of course, what Glenn did was to write rather obsessively about one subject, which is uh, also what uh, digital media is like. So he wrote, he was obsessively interested uh, and uh, in, in an almost scholarly way in, in, in terms of civil liberties and privacy uh, and the Internet. And, of course, that was what attracted Edward Snowden to him. Ed, Edward Snowden saw that that was somebody who he felt would would do justice to uh, the material that he had and the story that he wanted to tell. So you have to sort of go back a, a, a bit in time. Uh, I, I, I'll fast forward through the story because many of you will be familiar with it. But uh, so the, the, this leads to a moment uh, in which. Uh, Glenn gets on a plane to, to Hong Kong. I, I want a Guardian reporter in that room too. Uh, and so I insist that Ewan McCaskill from The Guardian is in the room with Glenn and Laurel Poitras, the filmmaker, and with uh, Edward Snowden. And it's quite, also, quite interesting that The Washington Post decided not to go and meet him. Um, so I, I think you've got, you've got a sort of interesting... Um, split in the ways that the, the, the news organizations were uh, behaving right from the start. Uh, and what Snowden, uh, I think, also rather cleverly did, which uh, I think has got many resonances for, uh, for journalists today, maybe in, uh, in South Africa as much as anywhere else, is he split the material up across geographies. So by the time we were editing it seriously some of it was in London some of it was in New York, some of it was in Brazil, some of it, some of it was in Germany so that made it very difficult for any one government to come down very heavily uh, and stop it um, uh, and there was the advantage from my point of view, particularly once the British government got heavy with us that you had the American First Amendment uh, on which you could, uh, behind which you could shelter your reporting. And I think this is another interesting thing that's happening today uh, that you could choose the very best jurisdictions in the world uh, in order to protect your reporting if that's uh, how you're set up. And that's certainly how The Guardian is now set up. 
so the so the initial dilemmas for for an editor was once once it became apparent the sort of material that we had was was should you look at it, um, and that the, there is some disagreement but not much amongst journalists about whether you would look at that kind of material. Uh, if you uh, do look at it, are you going to uh, use any of it? Uh, is the next um, uh, the decision uh, tree that we we had to take. Uh, and the third major decision was, uh, are you going to talk and engage with the authorities before you publish anything? Uh, and we decided we would look at it, we decided we would use it, and we decided that we would talk, uh, in most cases, with the authorities. Uh, and over the next six months, we had this process where we had more than 100 points of contact with the American authorities or the British authorities uh, because it, everybody was alive to the fact that this was very sensitive material uh, and that the, 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 the potential mishaps of using it uh, 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 wrongly were uh, great. Uh, there was a gulf that opened up uh, and again, you, you get it very quickly into into laws and, and how governments behave towards uh, towards journalists. But um, you, you probably know that the British government pretty soon uh, ran out of patience uh, and did this strange thing, which was to oversee us destroying all the material in London. Um, and to this day, I don't really understood what motivated them to do that because it was known to them that this material also existed elsewhere in the world. Um, and so the only thing they were doing by destroying it in London was to lose uh, any sense of control that they had uh, over it. But it did mean that we could uh, report from America. In America, there is almost no prior restraint or possibility of prior censorship of, of, of the media. And in a way, that leads to a more mature conversation between journalists. And if you know that there is not the option of going to law to stop you from publishing, then actually, perversely, you can then have a more mature conversation with government because uh, the, the, no one's going to come in with balaclavas and, and hobnail uh, boots. Uh, and you've also got the First Amendment uh, and judgments like the Pentagon Papers in 1972, which really set a very, very high bar. So if, if the government wants to say that national security is being imperiled, or the national interest is being imperiled, they have to go to the court and get a very, very high bar uh, uh, of satisfaction. Uh, and it was apparent that, that, that uh, the Obama administration simply wasn't going to do that. So. So that there felt very little threat in America, quite a lot of threat in in the UK. Uh, but as I said, um, uh, that in the modern world you can shift your reporting around and and take advantage of the best place to report. And then the, the there came into question for me, of of course, in as an editor in weighing up this material and d deciding what to use and how to use it, uh, the question of the public interest. Um, and I've, I've seen a lot of commentary in South Africa of the phrase the national interest, and it might be interesting just to discuss the difference between the national interest and the public interest. Uh, and what became interesting for me was that the more of the material that I read, that it was too simplistic to talk of a public interest, uh, that there seemed to be so many public interests involved in this. And sometimes the government tried to narrow it down to the public interest in publication versus the public interest in national security. Uh, and if, if I just very briefly sketch some of the things some of the issues uh, that, that, that it seemed to me were raised by the Snowden material. Uh, the first one was, was about the notion of consent, that if, if we are to have our lives trawled through by uh, governments and agencies and uh, our communications and thoughts and searches uh, uh, collected and stored and analysed, is it reasonable to expect any kind of consent from us? 
Um, the second issue was uh, a version of the same question, but taking it up to Parliament. Is it reasonable that Parliament should not be kept uh, in, in the knowledge uh, that this was uh, happening? Uh, and it became apparent that uh, parliamentarians in the UK certainly felt that they had not been kept in the loop and that uh, and the same in, in America. The people who drafted the national security laws in America uh, after 9-11 were the people who were most shocked by what had happened. They said that that's not what we intended by the, the post-9-11 uh, legislation. So the, the, those two issues of consent. That, that took you to, into the issue of legality uh, and the reality that all, all the laws that uh, were being used to justify the surveillance that was going on were all analog laws. So they were they, they were all predating Google and Facebook and uh, and Twitter and all all the things that we use in our lives, uh, and they were really uh, drafted for uh, an era of crocodile clips on uh, copper wires. And so there's a question of um, legality. Another huge public interest was the, 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 the what, what became apparent was that the infrastructure of this surveillance was not state in infrastructure so much as private infrastructure. So it was telephone companies and uh, and IT companies and web companies uh, who had the infrastructure. Uh, and so there are obvious questions there about us as users of these companies and the shareholders of those companies and the people who work for the companies and the extent to which they knew or were entitled to know uh, or we were entitled to know uh, what the deal is when we use these networks. There was, there became what for some people was the most significant story of all which was the integrity of the web itself. So, so that was the, the trap doors uh, and back doors that were put into the systems so that the uh, spooks could get in uh, to these uh, systems which all the cryptologists seem to agree weakened the whole integrity of the web itself. So that, that is a huge issue for, uh, for life in a, a digital age uh, and, and creates a big risk to the digital economy. So uh, I think one of the things that started happening was all these West Coast companies who thought they were building global businesses uh, suddenly found consumers in the rest of the world turning away from them because they simply didn't trust them. Uh, and uh, that, that, I think, will be a big spur to the conversation in, in future. There are obviously questions about international relations, uh, you know, the sort of Merkel factor uh, of uh, who, who is spying on who uh, and should, uh, should countries be spying on friendly countries and friendly heads of state uh, as well as uh, enemies. Um, has, has everyone told the truth uh, about what's going on? See, even within the framework, the, legal, the, 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 the legality of the framework that, that on which they relied, were they observing that and how would we know? There are, of course, huge issues uh, around uh, privacy, uh, which uh, I won't labour at the moment, uh, but uh, they are, there are huge issues for, for journalism and the protection of sources. Uh, and the fact that it seems to me pretty difficult as journalists today to offer sources uh, confidentiality uh, because it's just so easy to find out who your sources are if you use uh, email or if you carry a mobile phone around with you. Um, these are things that are very easily found out nowadays. Uh, and there's a question about proportionality. I, if you're going to construct this enormous uh, mechanism of surveillance, is there any evidence that it actually works uh, or, or is proportionate to the, um, uh, to the results? So th those were the kinds of the, the, the public interests that uh, seemed to me were brought into play by these articles. Uh, and I became completely convinced that these issues were so enormous and were not being discussed or understood that that's what a newspaper is there to do in order to 
um, in order to bring that sort of information in a reliable and safe and responsible way into the public domain so that they can uh, at least be discussed. Uh, and the, the final thing, then I'll, then I'll wrap up, was just, I, I think it's obvious to everybody that if you build these enormous systems, they, there is a great potential for abuse. Um, uh, you know, people were, were banding the word Orwellian around uh, and uh, it was interesting how different countries interpreted this story differently. So in, in, in Britain, uh, I think people tend to think of spies and they think of Enigma in the Second World War, they, they think James Bond. Uh, and uh, so the spies have a rather sort of heroic feel in, in the UK. Of course, in Germany, it was the Stasi. I mean, that, that was how the story was read in, in, in Germany. Uh, and spies are not glorious figures. They understand uh, the potential for uh, repression and uh, abuse in these systems. Uh, and, and so then, they, therefore, you have to ask, well, what is it if you're going to build these, the, these systems which are so potentially menacing what is it that, 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 that how can we have uh, comfort or satisfaction that they're being used properly and, and that, that takes, takes you into a whole issue of, uh, of oversight and who is equipped to do oversight uh, and whether the sort of people who sit in congresses and parliaments uh, and who are charged to do the oversight uh, can do it uh, are doing it uh, understand the technology enough to be able to do it uh, and uh, I, I think there were severe doubts about that. Um, so that, that, that's basically what struck me as interesting uh, uh, about it. And the, the final, final thing was how, how important it is as a community of journalists uh, to, to stick together on issues like this. There, there was a moment last autumn when British state came down pretty heavily on the Guardian uh, and for one reason or another, which I think was mainly to do with the Leveson uh, story um, the rest of the British press wasn't very interested uh, and that's quite a sort of dangerous moment because the government then sort of sniffed the air and think, actually I can maybe we can get away with this uh, and what, what happened was that the world's press spoke out uh, with a very resounding voice saying this is this is outrageous you can't do that uh, and so there's a kind of sort of you know what I was saying earlier about the the um, the ability to, to to root your reporting in the best protective uh, uh, domains uh, there's a there's, there's also an interest just to keep watching out as a community of journalists around the world so that when governments behave badly we can have a kind of solidarity, uh, which I think will become more and more important in time. Why don't I stop there and, and see where the conversation goes?